bởi vì chị làm ở đây chị mang đồ cho nó sáng sủa vậy. À. Ừ. Thành ra ví dụ như thở ở nhà là thở. Trước giờ đang cái gì chạy xuống tháng nữa là. Không, ừ, cũng có cái vốn mình đó chứ, không phải. Trừ thì nói chung là giữ thọ da thở là thở dưỡng nặng đẹp. Ví dụ thở, nhiều lúc thở không cần dưỡng, thở bịt, thở bịt thôi, thở đã đầy cả bởi vì cái vốn của thở cũng trắng. Cái vốn của chị không như thở, có chị đen hơn. Nhưng mà bởi vì thở 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 ra quá thì thở phải đen thôi. Dạ, em thở nhà em thở đó, nhà ừ. em bị gì đó. Nó nặng vậy Nó đây đó Nó rất là đẹp Nhìn chân hả? Nói mấy đứa chưa? Sao nó ra? Cả gì còn nữa kìa Ủa, vâng mà chỗ có chỗ không hả? Chị chị làm thứ ba À làm thứ ba bên mình được hả? Dạ. Nhưng mà trừ là chỗ có chỗ không có, không dạ, đầy nữa, đúng rồi Tại vì bạn mình không tính lần á, mình chỉ tính khi mua hết Khi mà chị đeo đi tìm á Mà cái nối cái gì sai lắm, nó có khách nghe không? Nó riêng rồi, thấy nè Chị cho mấy người một lần thôi hết rồi Đúng rồi, em thấy cái chị mà nào, 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 nào. Chị kia gì? Chị Linh 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 mà Chị Linh từng lần á Mà cái chị nó làm món quán có sao không còn có lượt nó mà chị kia Cái chị kia truyền cho nó còn sốt á Cái bác thì khách nó bác làm với bảo hiểm á Bảo hiểm nó mất với kêu mấy em sốt đường vậy á Em nhớ không? Trì có làm nó hết luôn thế chứ Mà sự làm nó dài dễ sợ luôn Không, đường đường là trong một lần rồi Đường đường xảy máy lần Nhìn vô cái lâm là biết Mà cái máy mình xịn ra em Có thì để Nếu mà mụn to quá thì để em Ừ, những ngày nó khá chị nó vừa trước giác mình câu xuống làm bức tường đúng không? Xe chi em? Xe bóng À không Ừ, hắn thăm hay là ra? Thăm Hắn thăm thì mua thức gì bao giờ? Ừ. Nó đang bị thăm à? Thăm thì giờ dừng thức vô Dừng thức vô hả?
câu mà nó giàu lắm chồng chiếc ô tô vợ chiếc ô tô là biết họ giàu cỡ mua rồi giờ rồi thấy cái hai cái kia cái nắng không có trong hả trong đó à của em tám chục đây Mấy đứa nhỏ này sẽ hơi lao hơn chút đó hả? Được mấy lần rồi hả? Ừ. Hạnh đỡ chưa? Ghê đó hả? Lần thứ 4 nữa hả? Ừ, thôi, mạnh quá thì từ từ chứ Chưa đủ đỡ mà không 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 đủ không đủ 80% trở lên là trả tiền lui Được chưa? Tới cái đủ xung của hắn là Long tưởng đỡ luôn Hạnh Ừ Ừ, đúng đâu người mạnh người yếu chứ người mạnh người yếu chứ máy ừ. ừ. con chị quyện bán thì cả ba chị hạng hai khách hai giờ không em không phải à máy rồi đã kiếm sáu rồi năm bảy lên về Ờ bé chiều nay có một rưỡi có chị nó tới dập mau dập mày nghe một rưỡi có chị tới dập mau dập mày
đi thở chơi chị đó mà chướng rứa đó chứ phải chuẩn bị thở chuẩn bị đẹp đâu thở chuẩn bị đẹp vì đang không vì làm làm đẹp thì sẽ đẹp không thở chị khó đi là sẽ được hết hả đó hồi xưa chị dưỡng dáng đẹp lắm hả dáng đúng rồi 2022 Genesis GV70 year long review. Is it a good road tripper? I'm not a huge fan of naming cars, but if it's a cool name and it goes with the model, I'm game. Recently, I took a road trip from Los Angeles to Napa Valley with three friends in our long term 2022 Genesis GV70, and even before we got to our destination, we baptized the Genesis as Helga. There's something about the name that works here, its standout styling penned by European designers is different from anything on the road, and with one of my friends being from Europe, she thought Helga was a good name for a model that competes in a European-dominated segment, even though the GV70 hails from South Korea. We left LA early on a Wednesday morning and headed north to Santa Barbara, where we stopped to have brunch and walk around its picturesque streets. Then, we continued to Paso Robles, where we stayed the night but not before we sipped wine while enjoying panoramic vistas of the beautiful rolling hills. The next day, Helga took us to Monterey along Pacific Coast Highway, and although heavy fog shrouded the scenery, everyone enjoyed the GV70's supportive seats, quiet ride, and settled cabin. I had the best seat in the house, though, as every hour Helga automatically started giving me a massage warding off back fatigue. Although the GV70's comfort and luxury were top-notch, we missed having additional cubbies in the center console, as our coffees took the space of both cup holders. We were, however, surprised with how much junk we could fit in Helga's trunk. My friends didn't travel lightly, and we managed to accommodate three large suitcases, two carry-ons, a backpack, and a couple of paper bags in the cargo area. We had to play Tetris the first time we loaded Helga, but I was surprised we didn't have to put any luggage in the middle back seat. On the tech front, our GV70's infotainment system provided everything we needed. Each one of us had our own USB port to charge our phones if we needed to, and we used Apple CarPlay on Helga's massive 14.5-inch screen to get us to our various destinations. My only complaint from the driver's seat was with Helga's traffic sign recognition tech. It often wrongly displayed the speed limits, at times telling us it was 43 miles per hour when it was 70 miles per hour. Instead of letting it bother me, I took the advice of Sirius XM Channel 53, our station of choice for the trip, and just chilled. Once we made it to Napa, we visited two wineries, and the following day we went to San Francisco, where we biked from Fisherman's Wharf to Sausalito via the Golden Gate Bridge. The last stop of our road trip was Yosemite National Park, where we spent a couple of days hiking along waterfalls and up to Glacier Point. We were all impressed by the tall pine trees and amazing cliffs. After a week of being on the road and driving more than 2,000 miles, we all appreciated the way our long-term Genesis GV70 behaved on the road and enjoyed all the luxury amenities it offers. On average, we got 25 miles per gallon during our trip according to the trip computer, a good number given its 3.5-liter V6 twin-turbo, which matches the EPA highway estimate, though trip computers are often optimistic. We weren't expecting anything less but the fact Helga proved herself to be a comfortable, enjoyable, and premium vehicle to spend time in made us recognize her even more. There will be more road trips to come, including one where we'll visit multiple states. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. 1974 Alfa Romeo GTV 2000 is our bring a trailer auction pick of the day. It was already one of the most desirable Alfa Romeos, but this GTV 2000 has also received a full overhaul from UK specialist Alphaholics. Its fuel-injected engine produces 230 horsepower, paired with a 5-speed manual transmission, lightweight suspension and bodywork, and upgraded brakes. Nearly $240,000 was spent by the previous owner to create one of the best driving restomods out there, and some lucky bidder can get it on auction from Bring a Trailer. In the old days, the stopwatch made the rules, 
whichever sports car was fastest to 60 miles per hour or around a circuit was the best. QED. Yet, even in that time, many enthusiasts waxed romantic about the appeal of an Alfa Romeo, not just performance but an experience. In an age when dollars equals speed, that appeal hasn't gone away. If anything, as in the case of this special little Alpha, the romance is even more concentrated. Up for auction on the website Bring a Trailer, which, like Car and Driver, is part of Hearst Autos, is this gorgeous confection of motoring con brio. Based on a 1974 Alfa Romeo GTV 2000, one of the prettiest coupes to issue from a Milanese factory, this one has been treated to a full workup from UK-based firm Alphaholics. With a week left to go until the auction ends on Wednesday, November 30th, bidding sits at $110,000. If paying new 911 money for an old Alpha sounds crazy, it's not. First, take the GTV 2000 itself. 1974 was the last year of these cars for the US market, and they had everything necessary to provide a special driving feel. With a frothy 130 horsepower twin cam engine, a nimble chassis tipping the scales at just over 2,200 pounds, and gorgeous styling, the Gran Turismo Veloce was everything that Alfisti could want. If the internal combustion wasn't always internal, that was just some added alpha zest. A life without even a little drama is not worth living, right? In 1977, Richard Banks bought the first Alfa Romeo Alfetta 2.0 LGTV in the UK, for competition in the British Production Saloon Car Championship. The car was very competitive. As a sideline to help pay for the racing, he bought and refreshed a second-hand 2000 GTV. It sold the same day as ad ran in the local paper. More than four decades later, Banks and his two sons, both trained as lawyers, but also involved in racing, run a family firm dedicated to creating the finest Alfa Romeos around. There's a temptation here to compare Alphaholics to California-based Singer and that company's reimagined 911s, but there are differences. Much of Singer's work is pure artistry but the cars that emerge from the Alphaholics workshop are more an organic result of one family's Alpha racing obsession. However, a 911 restored by Singer and an Alphaholics fettled machine are both idealized experiences of what you hope either a Porsche or Alfa Romeo will be. They are both a sort of cask strength distillation of the essence of the brand, the meet your heroes moment that doesn't disappoint. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. 2022 Audi A3 Cody Review, Three Flavors of Subcompact Luxury As cars get ever bigger, we're always excited to drive something small as a palate cleanser. Fully redesigned for 2022, the smallest car in Audi's US lineup is offered in three distinct sedan flavors, the Base A3, the Sporty S3, and the High Performance RS3. During our 2023 Motor Trend Car of the Year event, we enjoyed pushing the trio to their limits but encountered a couple sticking points along the way that made us question whether these pint-sized sedans are worth their liter-sized price tags. With powerful turbocharged engines across the lineup, every A3 variant is quick, even the 201 horsepower A3 managed to run from 0 to 60 miles per hour in 6.4 seconds. The more powerful S3 did the deed in just 4.6 seconds and the turbocharged i5 RS3 bested its siblings with a 3.6 second run. We found the drivetrains responsive and the dual-clutch automatic transmissions surprisingly refined as we accelerated to freeway speeds or ran through gears on a winding test track. Each one of these sedans uses an independent suspension, and by and large our judges found each variant handled pavement imperfections well though the RS3 is undeniably the stiffest of the bunch regardless of drive mode. High-speed stability was excellent across the board, and we found the steering feel to be dialed in, as well. The Audi A3 plays the role of daily driver well but can still inject a little more fun into a spirited jaunt on a curvy road. The S3 is a proper sports sedan, approachable yet exhilarating to flock but the RS3 is a different animal altogether, almost unrecognizable as part of the Audi A3 family. 
Director of Editorial Operations Mike Floyd called it hilarious fun on the figure 8 and RS Torque rear, Audi's name for drift mode. With 400 horsepower at play, the Petite RS3 has a feral characteristic that makes it a unique offering in its segment. Our biggest complaint with the trio of Audis was the pervasive sense of cheap plastics in the cabin. Although the interior is well designed and we like the unusual vent placement and hard button control scheme, our judges couldn't get past Audi's cost cutting approach. There's nothing aspirational about the A3's angular interior once you start to touch it, Buyer's Guide Director Zach Gale said. The center console's cup holder area and the space around the gear toggle are boring and cheap looking. Standard safety technology is also lacking, and buyers will have to option expensive packages to get desirable features that are becoming the norm on non luxury offerings. The hardest to justify was the RS3. Despite the special engine and splashes of green inside our test car that reminded some of a baby Lumbo, several judges found its S-tested price tag approaching $75,000 tough to swallow, especially given the cabin's deficiencies. If you're determined to spend money on one of these small Audis, we recommend the S3, the Goldilocks of the bunch in terms of performance and value. Its quilted leather seats elevate the cockpit to a more acceptable level for the money and foregoing a few items on the options sheet would bring it down from its almost $57,000 as tested price. We appreciate seeing genuinely subcompact cars still on the market, especially ones with a solid enough platform to support such a broad range of variants. What the A3 lineup lacks are improved materials and enough standard features to make these cars as luxury-leaning as their prices suggest they should be. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. 2024 Lucid Gravity, everything we know about the electric SUV. Not content simply launching an all-new EV with more than 1,000 horsepower and an expected EPA range of more than 500 miles, the mad geniuses at Lucid Motors are cooking up a new SUV, because of course they are, and today's market dictates they offer one. It's called the Lucid Gravity. Little official information is available at this point beyond these two key items. First, the gravity looks wider and will of course be much taller than the Motor Trend Car of the Year winning Lucid Air sedan, but it will sit on the same stretched wheelbase skateboard platform so the SUV slash CUV's length should be close to identical. Perhaps somebody whispered in our ear that the gravity is less than an inch, 15 millimeters, longer than the air, who's to say? Second, VP of Design Derek Jenkins is an off-roading enthusiast who has built a hot rod VW-powered dune buggy, so it's safe to assume the gravity will have some serious off-road chops. In the teaser shots Lucid released, you can tell the front will have nearly the same full-width light signature as the air. When you're establishing an all-new brand, the vehicles need to look alike, or at least design teams feel strongly that they do. We'd guess that the gravity's intake openings up front are larger than those on the air because the SUV is likely heavier and certainly blockier than the sedan, so the motors may need additional cooling to work harder. It also looks like the massive piece of glass that forms both windshield and roof is carried over from the air, although we expect, as on the air, a metal roof will also be available. You also can't see exactly what's going on out back but the massive clamshell opening from the air looks like it's becoming a signature across the lineup, reconfigured here for more of a trunk lid to a hatch. Because the gravity will borrow heavily from the air, the world's largest taillight likely also makes an appearance here, you can just see it in the provided photos. That said, the gravity is expected to be wider than the air, so maybe the single-piece taillight gets even bigger? We shall see. Now to what we can see. Check out them chunky fenders. The air comes on 285 width tires, and these look to be fatter, we'll guess 325. As such, the gravity's metal has swelled. It looks pretty tough, especially with the, probably, plastic fender cladding. The effect makes the gravity look more muscular than this felt air. Though Lucid isn't fully detailing the gravity's interior quite yet, at least beyond teasing renderings of the airy cabin, it is promising multiple seating configurations for 5, 6, or 7 adults, 
in two- and three-row layouts. There also appears to be a wild moonroof layout. Powertrains should be identical, dual motors good for 1,080 horsepower at launch, with single and tri-motor variants coming later, all powered by a 113 kilowatt-hour battery pack. And Lucid promises the electric gravity will deliver more range than any other EV on the market, other than its stablemate, the Lucid Air. Can't go stepping on the 500 mile air's toes now, can we? Still, an SUV should look tougher than a sedan. Like the Air, the Gravity should feature an air suspension, and like Range Rovers thus equipped, it should use set adjustable suspension to great effect away from pavement, think increased ground clearance at the touch of a button. We know Jenkins currently owns a Range Rover, which works exactly that way. One cool touch is how the A-pillars seem to drop through the flat-looking hood. It's a cool, utilitarian effect, and it helps to highlight another lucid design signature, the massive aluminum roof adornment. We also really like how the C-pillar resolves into the body on the gravity, the C-pillar being arguably the only weakness of the air's design. Turns out that fastback sedans with trunks instead of hatches frequently have compromised, disjointed C-pillars, looking at you, Cadillac CT5. Here, it looks smart and well integrated. Lucid is finally outlining when exactly we'll see the gravity land in customers' hands, late 2023. That, to us, signals that the SUV will be a 2024 model. It will be built in Lucid's Casa Grande, Arizona plant. This post was originally published on September 9, 2020, and has since been updated to reflect official imagery and details from Lucid, as well as drawings that Lucid trademarked of the gravity with the European Union Intellectual Property Office. 2023 Lucid Air Touring First Drive, The Sweet Spot Automakers are talking a lot about the future promises about what electrified vehicles they will bring to market, and when, are a focus, as are guarantees that self-driving cars, never mind what was said earlier, really are just around the corner. It's largely talk about future cars you can plunk money down on today and maybe get in two years' time. Meanwhile, the folks at Lucid have quietly been improving arguably the most advanced electric vehicle on the road, the Air Luxury Sedan. The top-level Air Grand Touring wowed us enough to earn our 2022 Car of the Year award, and the California-based automaker has since rolled out two high-performance variants, including the 1,200-plus horsepower, tri-motor Air Sapphire. Now, it's ready to release the other bookends to the Air lineup. The new mid-level 2023 Lucid Air Touring and Base Air Pure are expected to make up the bulk of Lucid sales and we just got the chance to take the new air touring for a quick drive. Why it's important While the limited run, Uberlux $170,000 Air Dream Edition and $155,650 Air Grand Touring models helped launch Lucid's flagship, the Air Touring aims to somewhat democratize the model. Starting at $109,050, the 2023 Air Touring trades in the Grand Touring's 113 kilowatt hour battery pack and dual motor setup, 819 horsepower in base form and 1050 horsepower in performance guise, for a slightly smaller pack and a pair of detuned motors. The Air Touring's dual motor AWD system makes a comparatively more pedestrian 620 horsepower, and it's fed from a 92 kilowatt hour battery pack. The new pack nets the air touring up to 425 miles of range, versus as much as 516 miles in the Grand Touring, winning rear seat passengers back a bit of legroom in the process. All airs feature Lucid's bleeding edge 900 volt electrical architecture, making them among the quickest charging EVs on the road today. Check out the all the additional details on the 2023 Air Touring and Pure Air. Pros, what we like. While our drive of the 2023 Air Touring was brief, it nevertheless served as a poignant reminder as to why the Air earned our 2022 Car of the Year award. Despite its more affordable price tag, this tremendously handsome, low-slung, Arizona-built sedan is still seriously luxurious. Visually, nothing immediately flags the Touring is the cheaper one, 
Aside from the optional aluminum top, a panoramic roof is the only choice on the Grand Touring. It's the same story inside. The elegant design and tasteful mix of textures, materials, and colors carry over. And, as an added bonus, the software has been redone, drastically improving both its speed and stability. We even hear Apple CarPlay and Android Auto compatibility are among the upcoming updates. Ditto for Sirius XM satellite radio. The GT's 200 horsepower weren't missed on our drive either. The Air Touring's tremendously compact electric motors are incredibly torquey and responsive, offering up V8-like performance in a package capable of clearing a claimed 4.62 miles per kilowatt hour, or nearly 156 mpge. The beauty of the Air Touring's powertrain is that it's quiet, sedate, and serene when you want it to be, but breathtakingly quick when you're in the mood to hustle. Few vehicles on the road embody that sort of effortless duality. For those still concerned about bragging rights, Lucid claims a 3.4 second 0 to 60 miles per hour run for the 620 horsepower air, just 0.4 seconds shy of its $155,000 sibling. Cons, what we don't like. Although we appreciate Lucid offering a more affordable air, its biggest drawback is its price, hence our saying somewhat democratize above. Like Rivian with its R1T and R1S, and Ford with its F-150 Lightning, Lucid raised prices for the air in the spring. That brought the air Turing's price to $109,050, up from $95,000. While the air's segment best range, cutting-edge technology, and high performance largely justify the increase, it doesn't make it any easier to swallow. Our other complaints are minor in comparison. As we found in our car of the year testing, brake feel is a bit artificial, and the user interface might have a high learning curve for those who aren't digital natives. Taller occupants will also want to mind their heads, part of the trade-off for the air's claimed 0.197 CD is its low roofline, which makes getting in the car slightly more difficult than more traditionally styled sedans. The bottom line. The Turing is a vivid embodiment of just why the air hoisted our golden calipers. So, how much are 0.4 second to 60 miles per hour and 91 extra miles of range worth to you? 2022 Lucid Air Grand Turing First Test, an impressive rethink of the luxury sedan. It's easy to overthink a car like the new 2022 Lucid Air Grand Touring. Between its groundbreaking miniaturized motors, good for 1,111 horsepower in their most potent configuration, game-changing battery tech that helps give the air up to 520 miles of driving range and the quickest charge speeds on the market, and its exceptional styling, there's a lot to unpack with the all-electric air. But what if we strip the 2022 Lucid Air back to its most basic purpose? Ignoring all the above, and the clear and present challenge the Air presents to Tesla's supremacy in the automotive luxury space, how is the Air simply as a car? Shockingly good, it turns out. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. 2023 Toyota Prius amazes with a hot new body and 220 horsepower. Toyota has revealed the U.S. version of the 2023 Prius Hybrid and the Prius Prime Plug-in Hybrid. The standard model produces either 194 horsepower or 196 horsepower, and the Prime has 220 horsepower. The new Prius will go on sale in the U.S. sometime next year. Every new car aims to be quicker and better looking than its predecessor but it wouldn't have taken much for Toyota to make such claims about the new 2023 Prius. Being slow and ugly has always been the Prius's thing, and that's not even meant as a knock against it. Slow and ugly worked for the Prius, which was a sales hit for many years and even won one of our 10 best awards in 2004. But the quintessential mass-market hybrid has fallen out of favor recently, among buyers and C-D staffers alike. The thoroughly reworked fifth-generation Prius appears to be just the right antidote. Significantly more powerful than before, it also offers slightly better fuel economy and adds many new features including solar panels and a hands-free driving feature. And wait, it looks like that? 
The same teardrop shape remains, but the new model's smooth side surfacing, elegant detailing, and far more athletic proportions make us look back at the previous model and wonder, what happened? If the Prius could have looked like this the entire time, why didn't it? The front end features scooped out headlights with a C-shaped LED accent light, while the rear has a full-width LED taillight strip that looks like the new Crown sedans. Two inches lower than before and one inch wider, the Prius has a whole new stance, and seemingly a new outlook on life. This extends to the new powertrain that bumps output up to between 194 and 220 horsepower, depending on the configuration. That's a huge uptick from the previous model's wheezy 121 horsepower. Toyota claims the new Prius will accelerate to 60 miles per hour in between 6.6 .6 and 7.2 seconds, which could make it feel like an NHRA dragster compared with the 10 plus second runs of the previous model. Although Toyota hasn't released detailed powertrain specs quite yet, one contributor to the newfound muscle is the 2.0-liter inline-four gasoline engine that replaces the previous 1.8-liter unit. All Pry now use a lithium-ion battery pack that's mounted under the rear seat, the old nickel-metal hydride pack that was still found in certain versions of the outgoing car is gone. The all-wheel drive Prius also swaps its induction-style rear axle-mounted motor to a new permanent magnet synchronous unit. A 194-horsepower front-wheel drive setup is standard, and the all-wheel drive model adds 2 horsepower to that total. The FWD-only Prius Prime, meanwhile, tops the range with its 220-horsepower plug-in setup that includes a larger lithium-ion battery that promises around 38 miles of electric driving range, compared with the previous Prime's 25 miles rating. Despite the extra grunt, Toyota also promises an EPA combined rating of 57 miles per gallon for the base front-wheel drive LE model with its 17-inch wheels. That's one better than the outgoing 2022 Prius Eco's 56 miles per gallon rating, although adding AWD and opting for the XLE and limited models larger 19-inch wheels will likely drop that number somewhat. Unlike before, the Prime plug-in doesn't offer much visual differentiation from the standard car, fortunately, they both look good now. But now that it's the most powerful Prius, Toyota is pitching it as the sporty one as it will be offered only in SE, XSE, and XSE premium trim levels. The standard car will have LE, XLE, and limited models, just like before. While the lower trims aren't anything fancy, they lack power seats, feature a relatively small 8.0-inch touchscreen, and will likely look dumpier on their 17-inch wheels. The limited and XSE premium models introduce some novel tech goodies and convenience features. A huge 12.3-inch touchscreen comes on board in the upper trims, along with a power lift gate, and a digital rearview mirror is optional. The Prime will offer solar panels for its glass roof that juice up the battery while the car is stationary to help power accessory functions and the air conditioning. Also exclusively optional on the Prime is a traffic jam assist function that allows the driver to go hands-free under certain circumstances under 25 miles per hour. We're expecting Toyota to raise the price somewhat on the Prius, but the base model should still come in under $30,000. Top versions will likely exceed $40,000, but maybe that's not such a stretch thanks to the Prius's newfound swiftness, high-end features, and, most of all, its undeniable curb appeal. This content is imported from Pole. You may be able to find the same content in another format, or you may be able to find more information at their website. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. 2023 Genesis Electrified G80 Cody Review Surprising Stunner. In our experience, vehicles that serve up both gas and electric powertrain options are masters of none. As the old Hyundai Ionic demonstrated, they're usually cramped, heavy, and unrefined because building a package that suits both an internal combustion drivetrain and an electric one results often in compromises for both. So according to recent history, then, the 2022 Genesis electrified G80 probably shouldn't be any good. 
yet to our pleasant surprise the understated electric G80 is impressive and then some. Riding on Genesis M3 platform, the electric 2022 G80 throws out the standard G80 somewhat lackluster gas engines and running gear and in their place plops and a permanent magnet electric motor at each axle and a big 87.2 kilowatt hour battery pack under the raised floor. Total system output is a peak of 365 horsepower and 516 lbft of torque. 10 fewer ponies than the G80 Sports 3.5-liter twin-turbo V6, but 125 lbft more twist. The electrified G80 can travel up to 282 miles on a full charge and is capable of quick charging with a 187 kW peak rate. Although it's not as quick as dedicated EVs like Genesis own GV60, that SUV has a 235 kW rate it's still enough to charge from 10 to 80% in as little as 22 minutes when plugged into the appropriately powerful Level 3 DC fast charger. With rivals such as Mercedes-Benz falling to the temptation of making their EVs look, well, different, the 2022 Genesis electrified G80 styling is refreshingly restrained. In fact, the only tells that electrons power this G80 are the lack of a fuel filler flap and the silver grille with the charge port hidden cleverly within it. In other words, the car is gorgeous. The G80 has a beautiful design with great surfacing, a fast back profile, a nice duck tail, and all the pleasing details of its G90 sibling, guest judge and frustrated designer Chris Theodore said. The interior design is lovely, too. Stunning, technical director Frank Marcus said. I love the forged wood trim. It doesn't look like anything else yet looks luxurious and interesting. It shouldn't, given its Frankenstein construction, but the G80 drives just as nice as it looks. The twin motor setup gives the electrified G80 butt bypassing power, replicating the feeling of a powerful but understressed V8 in a near silent and more efficient package. And although the electrified G80 is noticeably set up to be a well-cushioned cruiser, it also handles fairly well, ensuring a competent chauffeur will have no problem outrunning trouble while role-playing as a secret service agent outwitting an assassin. That's not to say there are no compromises within the G80 EV. As mentioned, the big battery pack under the floor, coupled with the rear motor, eats into cabin space. The electrified G80 sports 8 cubic feet less of passenger volume and 2.3 cubic feet less of cargo volume compared to the gas G80. That may not sound like much on paper, but in practice it leads to a trunk that's too small for larger suitcases and a cabin that's less comfortable due to the high floor, a fairly glaring flaw for what's supposed to be a grand touring road tripper, or at the very least, a luxurious airport shuttle. Even so, when you look past the slightly pinched accommodations, you find a superior G80 in the electrified model. As for us, we're happy to be proven wrong. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. 2022 Mercedes-Benz C-Class Cody Review, good, but not quite there. Upon the launch of the original CLA class for the 2014 model year, Mercedes-Benz created space for the C-Class, its previous base model, to move up market. With the debut of the newly redesigned version of the C, Mercedes aims for something that feels closer to a miniature S-Class than an entry-level offering. The results are mixed. Design is a strong point. The C-Class successfully scales down the drama of its larger siblings. Multiple judges commented it looked the size of an E-Class, with a classic sedan profile that affords it a roomy back seat and a sizable trunk. Interior design feels more upscale than the outgoing model, too. The Mark's new 11.6-inch vertical infotainment display does heavy lifting here, but judges also praised the car's wood and aluminum trim. The cabin looks more expensive than it feels, however. If you poke and prod, some of the plastics will creak and the metal trim will flex, features editor Christian Seabaugh noted, nothing is as nice to touch as it is to look at. We also took issue with the plentiful use of piano black trim, a material infamous for attracting fingerprints and scratches. On the plus side, multiple judges applauded the plush, 
thick rim steering wheel, and the level of customization in the infotainment and instrument cluster displays. The driving experience is similar, at times impressive, but also flawed. Some judges praised the ride quality, and others noted a general floppiness and pointed out that the suspension setup does not like undulating pavement. We also detected an undue vibration through the floor pan on the 4MATIC equipped AWD model we tested. We attributed that to the front drive shaft. Associate Editor Billy Rebach, for one, felt the previous C-Class had a pleasant driving experience that's simply missing from the new model, at least the base C300 and C304 Matic examples we evaluated. Some judges also felt the new C lacked some of the athletic character present in prior examples, an ability even its Sport Plus Drive mode wasn't able to unlock. But the C-Class isn't a slouch in a straight line with the base C300 running from 0 to 60 miles per hour in a respectable 6.2 seconds and the 4MATIC equipped model hitting the mark in 5.5 seconds. And numerous judges had good things to say about the new car's high-speed stability, a must-have attribute for any Autobahn-worthy German luxury sedan. Slowing down the C-Class was another matter entirely, as the brake pedal drew near universal disdain. One judge compared its squishy engagement and lack of feel to his far from mint 1995 E-Class, and another only half-jokingly thought maybe the brakes were broken. Taken as a whole, the new C-Class isn't a bad car. Far from it. Mercedes-Benz nailed the design inside and out, we're generally fans of the new mild hybrid base engine, the back seat is spacious for the segment, and highway cruising delivers stability we've come to expect. Its flaws, though, the brake feel, some lackluster materials, and a less sporty character than its predecessors, mean the redesigned C-Class just isn't quite car of the year material. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. 1988 Ferrari Testarossa is really rad, and it's today's bring a trailer auction pick. This 1988 Ferrari Testarossa that's currently up for auction on bring a trailer has us overdosing on nostalgia. Not only is the Testarossa an 80s icon thanks to the TV show Miami Vice, but the bat photoshoot has vivid retro vibes. This minty 88 Testarossa has just over 5,000 miles, all piled up from its 390 horsepower 4.9 liter flat 12 cylinder engine. The auction ends Tuesday, November 29th. If you waste as much time dream scrolling on Bring a Trailer as I do, by now you know the vast array of exotic and vintage vehicles can easily blend together unless you're searching for something specific. If I had a dime for every time I saw a Ferrari Testarossa up for auction, I feel like I'd have enough to actually afford one. However, the 1988 example that's currently listed on BAT, which, like car and driver, is part of Hearst Autos, caused me to pause due to its wonderfully retro photo shoot. There's just something about the purple and gold backdrop in the Testarossa photos that vividly recalls the 1980s vibe, a decade when cars were characters as big in American TV shows as the actors who drove them. Who can forget KITT, the black customized 1982 Pontiac Trans AM from Knight Rider, or the red Ferrari 308 GTS Quattro Valvo wheeled by a mustachioed Tom Selleck in Magnum P.I. And of course, the other ride that epitomizes the 80s is the Testarossa, like the white one Don Johnson's character Sonny Crockett drives in Miami Vice. All of this automotive nostalgia was stirred up inside me when I scrolled past the 88 Testarossa listing, and I was compelled to investigate further because I wasn't even quite sure what color paint it had. Upon closer inspection, I discovered it wore what Ferrari calls Oro Chiaro Metalizado, translation, clear gold metallic light blue-green. It certainly wouldn't be my first choice. Then again, what's tackier, or more appropriate to represent 1980s style than a gold supercar? For those of you who could care less about my incessant nostalgia, I'm happy to point out that this specific Testarossa only has just over 5,000 miles on it. Whether those were easy or hard miles, we'll never know. Judging by the pictures, though, this Ferrari looks pretty mint on top, inside, and underneath. Currently, it has a bit of $112,000, 
and the auction is set to end on Tuesday, November 29th. It's Nero Connolly, Reed, black, leather interior looks immaculate and free of wear, although the color combination is a boring choice, in my humble opinion. I think the seats look as if they were pulled out of a bumper car, and the center console is a distracting hodgepodge of buttons. Still, I only wish I could grip the Ferrari's thin rim three-spoke steering wheel and clink the shifter through its exposed gates. Did I mention this car comes with matching luggage? That is so fetch. Last but not least, the 1988 Ferrari Testarossa features a 4.9-liter flat 12-cylinder engine. By today's standards, its factory rated 380 horsepower and 354 pound-feet of torque wouldn't even impress people with a Ford Explorer ST in their driveway. When car and driver tested a 1985 Testarossa, it needed 5.0 seconds to hit 60 miles per hour and 13.3 seconds at 107 miles per hour to finish the quarter mile. Again, a 1,087 pound heavier, 400 horsepower Explorer ST is within tenths of both marks. Yet, in this admittedly random Ford vs. Ferrari comparison, it should be obvious that when it comes to the Testarossa, it's never going to be about the numbers. It's about being one of the most recognizable cars on the planet, and one that makes you feel like a suntan Sonny Crockett chasing coke dealing baddies through the streets of 1980s Miami. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. 2023 Mazda CX-50 Test Drive Checklist, 5 Things to Consider Behind the Wheel The salesperson throws you the keys to a new 2023 Mazda CX-50 and you sit in the driver's seat. Whoa! It's probably been years since you were behind the wheel of a new car, and here you are, butterflies in your stomach and a little overwhelmed. As your hands grasp the leather-wrapped steering wheel, one thought bubbles to the surface, what am I supposed to look for? The experience can be overwhelming, but we're here to help. We've spent thousands of miles driving our year-long 2023 CX-52.5T and plenty more with the standard engine CX-50, too. Spending so much time with these SUVs gives us a unique perspective, and we have a good idea of what they offer. Here are five things to consider on a CX-50 test drive. 1. Connect and use the dial. If it seems strange that we're starting a driving-focused review with your smartphone, let us explain. The goal is to make this time as close to your routine as possible. So if you are a regular user of Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, after you adjust the seat and mirrors, connect your phone to the car. The 2023 CX-50 has standard wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto as well as a 10.3-inch touchscreen on all but the base trim. That's a great start, and it means you don't need to upgrade to a higher-level trim to get good tech. Consider two things, how the infotainment system operates, and the screen's positioning. Although the phone mirroring features can operate via touch, the rotating infotainment dial is more conveniently placed about where your hand falls. Can you see yourself switching from the music screen to the map screen easily? We found that with a little practice, using the dial is easier than touch screens. When you're in motion, touch screens are more prone to inaccuracy. One ill-timed bump sends your finger to a different on-screen button than the one you wanted. That's never an issue with the dial, though some Motor Trend editors still prefer touch screens. One feature we've come to love is something we discovered over time. Pressing the home button below the dial gets you either to a calming view of a clock or, if you're an Apple CarPlay, sends you to our preferred layout, which splits the screen between Spotify and a navigation map. Easy, and you can access it without looking away from the road. Finally, notice how the 10.3-inch screen is positioned at the top of the dash and is tilted slightly toward the driver. Though not everyone is a fan of the screen's short height, its great positioning again means less time glancing down from the road to a screen. 2. Pay attention to steering weight. Heavy steering doesn't inherently make an SUV sporty, but the CX-50 steering has both qualities. We enjoy driving the CX-50 but do wish it required less effort to turn, even from one residential street to another. Having said that, 
CX-5 owners may find the CX-50 a slight relief in steering effort. Also, in the CX-50's case, this editor found the communicative steering to be exactly what was needed to feel confident in any maneuver. This is another one of those situations where the CX-50 divides the Motor Trend staff. In any case, if you start wondering whether the CX-50 feels heavier to turn than your car, it may not be you. 3. Suspension Harshness The best sports sedans communicate what's happening on the road, but not so much that every trip becomes an exhausting chore where you feel every bump. Because the CX-50 wears a Mazda badge, it should come as little surprise that the compact SUV is tuned towards sportiness. If you want a cushier suspension, get a Subaru Forester. But you don't want that boxy Subaru, you're interested in a Mazda because the CX-50 speaks to you. Unfortunately, the CX-50's ride on available 20-inch wheels is firm, so make sure you can live with the suspension tuning. If you aren't sure after a test drive or two, try a CX-50 with its standard 17ths or the Meridian trim and its 18ths. Though we prefer how the CX-50 looks on its available 20-inch wheels, other trims less aggressive rubber may result in a more cushy ride. 4. Acceleration Do you ever press the accelerator pedal down more than halfway? If so, this one's important. Our test had the CX-50 Turbo hitting 60 miles per hour in 7.0 seconds. Not bad, but also not great. We wish the SUV were quicker even if it does sound sweet at wide open throttle. The base engine CX-50 does the 0-60 to 60 sprint in 8.5 seconds, which is okay for its segment. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. 2023 Aston Martin DBX 707 vs 2022 Porsche Cayenne Turbo GT From the December 2022 issue of Car and Driver Once it was established that high-performance SUVs were not an oxymoron, there was only one direction to go, up. More speed, quicker acceleration, greater grip, more tenacious braking, and, most of all, higher prices. At Porsche, the progression of high-test versions with more horsepower and compound badge extensions has led to the 2022 Cayenne Turbo GT, a veritable sport utility weapon capable of amazing things on the track, up to and including the vaunted Nürburgring. Other high-end carmakers have joined in, even Ferrari with its upcoming Purosang. Aston Martin entered the fray a couple of years ago with its DBX. We'd surmise, however, that the beastly 2023 DBX 707 was in the model plan from the outset. These Cayenne and DBX models make an excellent pairing, and not just because our samples were painted focus group white to prevent color bias from creeping in. Ferocious twin-turbo 4.0-liter V8 engines vigorously propel both with the Porsche's 3,996 cubic centimeter power plant generating 631 horsepower and the Aston ringing 697 horsepower from a mere 3,982 cubic centimeters. Beyond that, both vehicles have all-wheel drive and ride on air springs augmented with electronically controlled dampers and active anti-roll bars. Both feature high-stance terrain modes of dubious relevance and they also command sky-high prices. The lightly optioned Porsche in our test goes for $189,090, while the glitzier Aston Martin commands $290,086. Second place, Aston Martin DBX. If we determined a champion based on onlookers' attention, the Aston would take this win, hands down. People stopped us at gas stations, wanting to know what it was in snapping photos. When you view the vehicles side by side, this makes sense. The 707 has presence. It's fresh, modern styling is festooned with intriguing details, although the diffuser's fiddly spoiler is one we could do without. Highs, undeniably fast, roary soundtrack, stunning design. Lows, insufferable infotainment, eye-watering price. Verdict, if money were no object, we wouldn't object. The same is true inside, where the DBX comes across as interesting and layered. The seats and dashboard look as if some design capital was spent on them, 
and the carbon fiber center console is far more intricate and deliberate than the perfunctory stuff tacked onto the Porsche's door panels. But, as on the outside, the design would come off better if it were real than about 5%. If we determined a champion based on onlookers' attention, the Aston would take this win, hands down. People stopped us at gas stations, wanting to know what it was in snapping photos. When you view the vehicles side by side, this makes sense. The 707 has presence. It's fresh, modern styling is festooned with intriguing details, although the diffuser's fiddly spoiler is one we could do without. Highs Undeniably fast, roary soundtrack, stunning design. Lows, insufferable infotainment, eye-watering price. Verdict, if money were no object, we wouldn't object. The same is true inside, where the DBX comes across as interesting and layered. The seats and dashboard look as if some design capital was spent on them, and the carbon fiber center console is far more intricate and deliberate than the perfunctory stuff tacked onto the Porsche's door panels. But, as on the outside, the design would come off better if it were real than about 5%. The Aston is a steady and calm interstate cruiser, with a smooth ride and a steering system that imparts a clairvoyant sense of straight ahead through its nicely contoured wheel. But we did miss a head-up display in this driving scenario and over time the attractive seats prove to be less comfortable than they appear, with obtuse side bolster and lumbar controls we never came to grips with. But the biggest gaffe has to be the infuriating infotainment system, which is controlled only by a touchpad or a half-hidden knob that is utterly inaccessible if you actually use the cup holders. Perhaps Aston should move them ahead of the controller and add a bona fide touchscreen to give the driver choices. What's more, phone mirroring requires a cable, even though the center console's handy open basement contains a wireless charging pad. Meanwhile, those seated in the rear will be happy as clams back there. Space is abundant, and climate control vents are mounted in the center console as well as attractively set into the door pillars. At the end of the day, the biggest thing holding the Aston back is its near dash dollar 300 price tag. If you're able to scoff at that sentence, well, don't let us stop you from making a purchase. First place, Porsche Cayenne. Compared with the Aston, our white Porsche's rounded off styling suggests a used bar of soap, with a grill opening that looks like a hockey player's wide grin with dentures out. Tellingly, an influencer snapping pictures of our DBX framed the Cayenne out of his shots. But the Turbo GT has got it where it counts, making it a superior sleeper. Despite having 66 horsepower less, the Porsche bolts out of the gate harder, reaching 60 miles per hour in a mere 2.9 seconds and maintaining that 0.2 second advantage through 100 miles per hour and across the line at the quarter mile in 11.2 seconds at 120 miles per hour. The more powerful Aston starts to outrun it after that, but it's a close run thing in a speed realm that has zero daily relevance. Back on Earth, the Porsche's 30 to 50 and 50 to 70 mph passing times trail the Aston by a tenth and two tenths, respectively. That's probably due to the fewer ratios of its 8 speed automatic, but the GT still delivers heady passing performance and benefits from a smooth shifting gearbox. Highs, immediate control response, grip for days, lower price leaves room for options. Lows, forgettable styling, flintier ride. Seats only four. Verdict, the Porsche of Hall ass SUVs. In the mountains, the Turbo GT standard rear-wheel steering and active roll control team up to make quick work of tight hairpins, flowing SEs, and long sweepers alike. The steering response is laser-sharp, and the brake pedal feels immediate and intuitive. You just think about doing things and they get done. It's a oneness the Aston can't match. There's also grip for days, and that's not just in our head, a monster 1.03 G's around the skid pad proved it. But there's a catch, one that likely accounts for the launch advantage, the immediate turn-in response, and certainly the lateral grip, but curiously no significant stopping distance superiority. The Turbo GT's Pirelli P0 Corsa PZC4 tires have a scant 80 treadwear rating, 
the Astons are 280. That's so extreme, they wouldn't be legal at an SCCA autocross. Tire Rack classifies them as streetable track and competition tires, and we doubt they'll last 10,000 miles. Still, perhaps from the perspective of the happy side of a $100,000 price gap, chucking a lot of them at the Porsche feels affordable. That yes, but theme continues on the open road, where the Turbo GT's standard Alcantara steering wheel feels like, as senior editor Alana Scher put it, an elderly cat, all bones and fur. Rest assured, there's a more comfortable, and heated, will on the typically extensive Porsche options list. The same can be said of the dual-zone climate control, which can be upgraded to four zones with a comparatively modest spend. The DBX has a standard three-zone setup, and our Porsche's lack of adaptive cruise control. The standard eight-way sport seats are comfortable over the long haul, though, and they do much to take the edge off rougher roads. That said, you could also upgrade to 18-way chairs. What you can option away is the slightly less compliant ride the four-place seating, and the 1 MPG worse EPA combined fuel economy rating, which relates back to the gummy tires and the cog-deficient 8-speed automatic. But there are 100,000 reasons why this doesn't matter, and there's no denying that the Porsche Cayenne Turbo GT is the more potent and rewarding sport utility weapon. Plus, if that interested influencer is any indication, the local constabulary will likely direct their attention to the Aston instead. 2023 BMW iX M60 is an EV that delivers power and exclusivity. Back in the early days of the BMW 2002, BMWs were rare and driven mostly by enthusiasts. They often flashed their brights upon encountering another member of the then tiny tribe. These days, BMW sells around a quarter million cars a year in America, and their drivers are neither committed nor rare enough to observe such niceties. But with the electrically powered 9, BMW might well recreate that exclusivity. Although it's roughly the size of the X5, the iX has little in common with that established SUV, structurally or visually. The iX was introduced as a newly developed 2022 model with a unique structure made from high strength steel, aluminum, plastic, and carbon fiber. The chassis uses a mostly aluminum control arm suspension with dual lower links in front and a multi-link layout in the back. It sports a giant version of BMW's vertical rendition of the traditional twin nostrils, and the iX lacks the full-length character lines of most BMWs. It's a rather shapeless lump, particularly in the contra-smothering Storm Bay metallic hue of our test car. However, it is a smooth lump, with a drag coefficient of 0.26. 9M60 Performance The iX launched as the X-Drive 50, but now BMW has added the more powerful 9M60. It boasts uprated front and rear electric motors producing a maximum of 610 horsepower, in sport mode, and up to 811 pound-feet of torque, using launch control. These figures are up by 94 ponies and a whopping 247 pound-feet compared to the X-Drive 50. Highs, impressive real-world highway range, warp drive acceleration, sitting inside it. As you'd expect, these increases are noticeable. Acceleration to 60 miles per hour consumes but 3.2 seconds, and the quarter mile is covered in 11.5 seconds at 120 miles per hour both figures almost a second better than the already quick X-Drive 50. For a machine that weighs the better part of 3 tons, such acceleration is amazing. And thanks to its instantaneous response and shift-free acceleration, the M60 feels even quicker than these figures. With a twitch of your right foot, you can pass just about anyone, anywhere, at any speed, with little effort. On a winding mountain road, this acceleration slingshots you from corner to corner with nearly the intensity of a 1,000 cubic centimeters crotch rocket. Driven this way, you need more than regenerative braking to slow you down, and the M60's big discs are up to the job. In our testing, they hauled the M60 to a stop from 70 miles per hour in 160 feet. To match its driver's preferences, the M60 offers multiple levels of Reagan braking, 
as well as one pedal driving, which requires only brief adaptation and is very convenient in urban driving. It's a feature you quickly get used to. Air springs and rear wheel steering, both optional on the X Drive 50, are standard here. Though the M60 bends into corners willingly at a fast clip, there's no mistaking that you are piloting a massive machine. And despite the 275-40 or 22 Bridgestone Alenza 001 tires on our test vehicle, the maximum corning grip is only 0.87 g, one count less than the X-Drive 50 managed. Blasting effortlessly through everyday traffic is more suited to the M60's inclinations. In that role, the M60 is remarkably capable. It rides very nicely, thanks to the adjustable shocks and air suspension at all four corners. Road noise is also reasonably low, and there's plenty of space inside. In fact, despite being a couple of inches lower than an X5, the M60 has more passenger room, front and rear, and greater luggage space as well. Ritzy, Tech Forward Interior its interior appointments are also very nice, with lovely perforated upholstery and the same cut glass crystal-like controls for seat adjusters, volume controls, and iDrive knobs that you find in the just-introduced new 7 Series models. It's a comfortable cabin for your journeys. The instrument layout is very much in the current BMW idiom with the curved display incorporating a 12.3-inch LCD instrument cluster in front of the driver and a 14.9-inch display for iDrive 8, in the center of the dash. It's an attractive, legible, and usable arrangement, though the so-called hexagonal steering wheel is a fashion affectation that partially blocks the cluster and is hardly necessary for thigh clearance. Many of the instrument cluster configurations provide information in a random and not necessarily attractive fashion. And the iDrive screen has 37 icons, each representing functions offering submenus of varying degrees of complexity. For example, you can select an option that tries to replicate the ambience of an internal combustion engine but sounds more like a wheezing turbine. 2023 BMW XM is a hybrid super SUV with 644 HP and a crazy design. BMW has revealed the new 2023 XM, a performance SUV with a plug-in hybrid powertrain. It features a twin-turbo V8 and an electric motor that combine to produce 644 horsepower and 590 pound-feet of torque. The XM starts at $159,995 and will go on sale in the U.S. in the first quarter of 2023. BMW M is best known for sports sedans like the M3 and M5. But the performance division is going in many new directions as of late, and the new 2023 XM combines many of these fresh elements in a single vehicle, fitting, as this is meant to be M's new flagship. As an SUV that's available exclusively as an M, the XM also introduces a new plug-in hybrid powertrain that's the first hybrid ever to wear the M badge. The concept version of the XM proved controversial when it made its debut last year, and now we have all the details on the production version that's slated to go on sale in the US in the first quarter of 2023. The XM's powertrain consists of a twin-turbo 4.4-liter V8 combined with an electric motor integrated into the 8-speed automatic transmission. There's also a 25.7-kWh battery pack that enables an estimated electric driving range of 30 miles. Total output sits at 644 horsepower and 590 pound-feet of torque, and there will be an even more powerful label red version coming later on with a claimed 735 horsepower and 735 pound-feet. This makes the XM the most powerful current production BMW, and it'll need all that grunt to move around its 6,062 pound mass. Were it not an M exclusive, the XM might otherwise wear the X8 designation. It's considerably larger than both the X5 and X6, but smaller than the 3-row X7, much like the relationship between Audi's Q7 